Hello, this lecture corresponds to section 4.4 in the LOCK5 textbook, and this section covers a lot of various issues and topics within hypothesis testing. The main um, issues presented in this section include type 1 versus type 2 errors, the issue of multiple testing, why it's important that we replicate our studies, the distinction between practical and statistical significance, and then the impact of sample size on statistical significance. So just as a review, when we're doing formal hypothesis testing, we're going to do the following. We're going to state the null and alternative hypotheses. We're going to set our alpha, and we've said in this class we are typically going to set it to 0 0.05. We're going to determine the value of our observed sample statistic. So that could be our sample proportion or our sample mean, or a difference in sample means or a difference in sample proportions, or sample correlation. Then we're going to calculate the p-value using a randomization test. We're going to interpret that p-value as well. And we're going to make a decision to reject or not reject the null hypothesis based on the relationship of that p-value to alpha. And then we're going to talk about the strength of evidence of that p-value uh, for the alternative. So one of the examples that your book has been talking about is um, looking at mice uh, that have been exposed to light at night versus mice that have had the normal light-dark cycle, and looking at weight gain. And so really in this particular research um, study, what we're interested in understanding is what is the impact of light on weight gain for mice? And we're comparing them to mice that have the normal light-dark cycle, so they act sort of as our control. So, um, we, we conduct our study, we determine that our sample mean for light is 6.732, and our sample mean for those that were in the normal light-dark is 4.114, indicating that, at least in the sample, those mice that were in the light 24 hours a day condition um, were expected to gain more weight on average. So what are the null and alternative hypotheses here? So our null hypothesis is going to be that the weight gain for both of these is the same. And the alternative is that the weight gain is greater for mice that are in the light than are in the dark. <clears throat> so next thing we need to do is we need to uh, use a randomization distribution to calculate our p-value. So we can open up our stat key here go to test for differences in means, look for the um, weight gain, light uh, light versus dark at night, which I think is this one. Yep. And then we'll generate uh, 10,000 samples. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're going to do a right tail test because it's an alternative. And we're going to change this to our sample um, statistic, which is the differences in means, which um, is 2.62. And you can click OK to hit Enter. And we know it's 2.62 as well because under, the, uh, under the, the column that says original sample, it shows us our sample mean right there as 2.62. Our sample difference in means, I should stay, state. So our p-value is 0.016. Oops. Point zero one six. Okay, so let's interpret it. So, given that there is no difference in average weight gain between mice in the light. and dark conditions, the probability of observing a sample difference in means as extreme 
more then 2.62 is 0 0.016 that's our interpretation so we make a decision about alpha I mean, excuse me, we make a decision about the null hypothesis with respect to alpha. So if we set alpha to 0 0.05, our p-value is 0 0.016. Our p-value is less than alpha. So we reject the null hypothesis. But there's an important thing to understand here in this interpretation of the p-value. It says, given that there's no difference in average weight gain between mice in the light and dark conditions, the probability of observing a sample difference in means as extreme or more than 2.62 is 0 0.016. So this is given that there's no difference, the probability essentially of observing a value like this just by chance alone is 0 0.016. So that means that it's still possible that we could have observed a difference in means of 2.62 by chance alone still. So what we don't know then when we reject a null hypothesis is whether or not in the population there really is a difference between these two groups, right? We don't know if there is a difference um, we, we, we don't know if there's a difference in the population. We only have our sample as our proxy for that. But when we've rejected the null hypothesis, we're essentially concluding that there is a difference or that it's extremely unlikely that it would have happened by chance alone. So this brings us to this thing down here, which is kind of like a truth matrix, if you will. Because formal hypothesis testing always re results in us rejecting or not rejecting the null. However, the truth is, is that the null is either true or it's false. And we don't actually know the truth, right? We know our decision, we know this part, but we never know the truth. So let's go through this table here. Um, so when our null hypothesis is true, but we reject the null hypothesis, we make something known as a type one error. So this is concluding that there is a difference or there is an effect when in reality there was not. Now, if the truth is that the null hypothesis is true, but we do not reject the null hypothesis, this means we conclude that there is not an error. In fact, we made the right decision. We, re we did not reject it, and we shouldn't have rejected it because it was true. So, if we're in the situation where the null hypothesis is false, but we reject the null hypothesis, this is also a correct decision. So we don't make an error. But if the null hypothesis is false and we fail to reject it, we do not reject it, then we've committed a type 2 error. So these are important things to understand, type 1 and type 2 errors. The, it, the thing to keep in mind is we never know the truth. We never know that. All, all we ever know is if we make a decision. And so every time we make a decision to reject the null hypothesis, or to not reject the null hypothesis, we're, we are always at the possibility of committing an error. Well, what would these look like? So let's write what the type 1 error for the mice experiment should look like. So <clears throat> basically, we're concluding there is a difference in weight gain between mice in the dark in the light in dark conditions and note i'm referring to here mice all mice right so we're talking about this is a population statement just to make it clear Concluding there's a difference in weight gain between mice in the light and dark conditions, when in reality, there isn't. That's what a type 1 error would look like. So we've rejected the null hypothesis, and we've concluded there is a difference, but actually there isn't. That's what a type 1 error looks like.
Now, a type two error is the is the sort of like the converse. So concluding there is not a difference in weight gain between mice in the light in dark conditions. When in fact, there is. So there isn't, is. So you can see the differences between these two. So for the type two error, we do not reject the null hypothesis but we should have. In the type one error, we do reject the null hypothesis, but we should not have. So those are important ideas to understand. I will definitely ask you to write a type one and a type two error on a quiz um, within the context of a problem. And I'll also ask you to tell me if we could have committed a type one or a type two error. Now, we can only commit a type one error when we reject the null hypothesis. It's the only time it's possible. And you can only commit a type 2 error when you do not reject it. And this parallels what's in that table above, right? We have those two decisions. The, the column on the left was that we reject. The column on the right was that we do not. Let's look at another example. Is the water in Lake Champlain unsafe to drink? Mercury is toxic to humans. It can enter water from polluted runoff and precipitation. Humans can be exposed to mercury by eating contaminated fish, absorbing it through their skin, or inhaling it from the atmosphere. Mercury has been identified as a concern for Lake Champlain. The maximum contaminant level goal, the level of a contaminant in drinking water below which there is no known or expected risk to health, is 0 0.002 milligrams per, per liter. What is the null in the alternative hypothesis? So here our research question is, is the water in Lake Champlain unsafe to drink? Okay. Um, and so we see here that this is sort of this value here is the value that we know if it's above that value, it's unsafe to drink. So our null hypothesis is going to be that the water is safe to drink. And our no alternative will be that it's not. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So the, the null is that the water is safe to drink. The alternative is that the water is unsafe to drink. In other words, it's greater than that. And we know we're dealing with a mean here because we're dealing with a, a number, this, this, uh, this amount of mercury in milligrams per liter. So what would a type one and a type two error in this context mean? So a type one error would mean that we reject the null hypothesis, <clears throat> which would mean that we would conclude that the water in Lake Champlain is unsafe to drink, when in reality, it's safe to drink. So conclude water unsafe to drink, but in reality, It's safe. Now a type two error is gonna be that we conclude the water is safe to drink. In other words, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Water safe to drink when it is not. Okay, so we do not reject the null hypothesis, but we should have. That's what the type two means here. And the type one is we did reject the null hypothesis, but we should not have. So my question for you here, something to think about, is which one do you think is the more dangerous error to commit? Is it more dangerous to commit a type one error here, where we conclude that the water is unsafe to drink, but in reality it's actually safe? Or is it um, worse to commit a type two error here, where we conclude that the water is safe to drink, 
but it really is not. So these are important things to think about. Because we have some control over committing a type 1 and a type 2 error. So if our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So in other words, this alpha sets our comfort or our tolerance with making a type 1 error. So as our alpha gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, that means that we are less comfortable with making a type 1 error. In other words, we're less comfortable with concluding that um, we're, we're less comfortable re with rejecting the null hypothesis when we shouldn't. Now, if we want to avoid concluding that mercury levels in Lake Champlain are safe to drink when they are not, should we make alpha high or low? If you want to avoid concluding that mercury levels in Lake Champlain are safe to drink when they are not, should we make alpha high or low? So we want to conclude that, right? So our null hypothesis was that um, ultimately what we're looking for here is we want to be able to be in a situation where we can more easily reject our null hypothesis, right? So we want to more easily reject H0. So the only thing that we know at this particular point to doing that is to set alpha bigger. So we want to make alpha bigger. Because if we set alpha to say 0.1, then if our p-value is 0 0.09, that's less than alpha, which means that we conclude that the water in Lake Champlain is unsafe to drink. Okay? And so that protect help that will that's one way, at least using the alpha, that we can help to protect against a type 1 error. So I hope the ideas of type 1 errors and type 2 errors make sense. And I hope you understand that alpha is our comfort level with or our tolerance with making a type 1 error. Now we're gonna dive into a little bit more about type 1 errors here. And this relates to the issue of multiple testing. When we conduct multiple independent tests, the probability of making a type 1 error, or alpha, increases. And it increases like this. this it's a formula of 1 minus 1 minus our type 1 error rate uh, to the m, where m is our number of tests that we're going to conduct. So in other words, as the number of tests as m increases, alpha increases. So the more tests that we conduct, the greater the probability of committing a type 1 error rate because our alpha is increasing. So there are many ways to address multiple testing um, by adjusting our alpha. So lots of people will do lots of tests and research, and there are lots of ways to sort of adjust. The easiest way is the thing known as Bonferroni's correction. And this is mentioned in your textbook. Basically, you take alpha and you divide it by the number of tests. Or if I'm going to use my notation I used above, alpha over m. Another way to sort of address this issue of a much more costly but a very important way to do it is with replication. So if we repeat our study again, we can look and see, oh, do we get the same results? In other words, did we not commit an error? Or do our results change? If our results change, we know we've committed at least a type 1 or a type 2 error. I shouldn't say at least. We know we've committed either a type 1 or a type 2 error. Um, so these are important things to do. And replication is a really important piece. And it's particularly relevant right now. And, it, and we'll talk about it in, uh, in the example in the next slide uh, a little bit more. <clears throat> so the issue of multiple testing also comes into play in this notion of publication bias. And this is something you've maybe heard of, um, and that's the idea that only significant results get published. So if your p-value is less than 0 0.05, that means you get a paper. You can get a paper published in a journal. At least this is how it's, historic, what, how, how it's historically been made. 
case. Now, if your p-value equals 0 0.06, and I would argue from a statistical perspective, there's no difference between a 0 0.05 and a 0 0.06, you do not have a paper. So you can have a little sad face here. You don't get your paper. Here, you're super excited. You got your paper. Here, you're super sad that you do not. Even though, in reality, there's really no difference. Um, and so one thing that ends up happening is that a lot of people will conduct a lot of tests. And so we, we've seen up here that this testing, our alpha, which, which in this equation we represented was alpha bar because it's not the same alpha. Um, we know that the probability of uh, one, of those, one of those tests just being significant by chance alone is increasing. And so this means that we're going to end up in a situation where a lot of tests can be conducted. Very few of them are actually reported in the papers because they're only reporting the significant tests, which means that the probability of having type 1 errors um, sort of proliferating throughout publication ends up being somewhat higher. So this is a problem, and this is a problem of multiple testing. Um, I don't want to, to give you the impression that all research is conducted in such a way that essentially researchers are out there looking for any result that they can find that's significant and that that's driving what they're publishing and what they're writing. That's certainly not the case. And it's also not the case that these issues aren't being addressed. Uh, there's a lot of people working really hard um, in fields that are doing research that have sort of been um, abusing the notion of a p-value -value for a little while um, to correct that situation. Now let's talk about clinical trials. This is a, uh, an example from your book, and I, I, I really thought it was interesting. It's relevant to uh, the current time, right? We are living in the COVID world, and we're talking about uh, clinical trials for coronavirus vaccines. And so you've probably heard words like phase one, phase two, phase three, um, or may maybe you haven't, but various vaccines are in these various stages of trial development. So I thought it was kind of interesting to go through this one. So clinical trials are studies on people investigating a new drug or medical treatment. And in the United States, these are conducted in four phases. During phase one, a new treatment is tested for safety on a small group of people. So the phase one test is just a safety test. In other words, not, not does this drug work, but will this drug make people sick? In phase two, an experiment is conducted to test the effectiveness of the new treatment. And so in this situation, this is the first time we're trying to look at the effectiveness. So, so at this point where we've sort of concluded the drug is, it appears to be safe, but now is it effective? And generally, we want to compare, like, is it effective against, say, just sort of a placebo, so maybe like a sugar pill or, or something like that. But these studies tend to be smaller. So they have small ends. They have fewer participants, less money. In phase three, which are the big ones, if the phase two experiment yielded statistical significance, we conduct another experiment, this time with a much larger sample size, and we usually compare it against an existing treatment. Now, in the case of a, of a vaccine, like the coronavirus vaccine, you're not really going to have it to compare it to an existing treatment, um, but instead you're, you're going to sort of compare it to no treatment. That is kind of the existing treatment. So in a way, it's, the controls are, would be people without the vaccine. And so you're looking to see, does the vaccine either pr uh, prevent the uh, uh, the vaccine does the vaccine either prevent the virus from you know entering humans and reduce the number of uh, coronavirus cases, or is it reduce say the severity of coronavirus? Because those are generally how vaccines work. They either um, intend to sort of prevent you from getting it or reduce the symptoms if you get it. Right. So the flu shot that we get doesn't necessarily prevent the flu, but is uh, but is intended to sort of reduce the severity of the flu. So phase four uh, tests um, are the final phase, and these consist of data collection on users after the drug has gone to market, but they only occur if both phase two and phase three yield significant results. So why do you think two separate randomized experiments are required for clinical trials? So I hope that you can see, okay, well, 
this relates to the ideas of errors that Chris has just been talking about. So let's say we had phase one, I mean phase two, excuse me, phase one is just about safety. Phase two, it's significant. Yay, our p-value is small, it's less than alpha. We conclude that our drug is effective. So that means one of two things. It's effective. Um, or it's a type 2 error. I mean, a type 1 error. Now, if our p-value is, is greater than alpha, then we would conclude that it's not effective or we made a type 2 error. So in phase 3, what we're really looking to do is to test whether or not it was effective or if it was a type two, a type one error. If our p-value is again small, then we're more certain that it's effective and not a type one error. Okay, so this relates to the idea of um, type 1 and type 2 errors, and I think this is a really neat um, problem. Uh, could, be, could be a problem that might appear again somewhere later. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit, but still not really. Remember, we're talking about hypothesis testing, and we're talking about significance. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this really amazing program. Um, it's this program called Easy SAT. It's trademarked. So it's not a real program, um, and it's uh, influenced by sort of the example in your book, because again, I think it's kind of a, a problem that resonates. There are many programs out there that claim to increase your SAT score. Imagine a program called Easy SAT, trademark that claims to significantly increase your SAT in 16 short weeks and cost only $2,000. So it's going to significantly increase your SAT. An experiment was performed where 100 students were randomly assigned to the study uh, to study how they normally would for the SAT. This is what's sort of known as a business as usual model or business as usual approach. And 100 students received easy SAT, which is our trademark program. The average score for the students in the business as usual was 539, and for the average score for students in the easy SAT trademark was 546, which is a seven point difference. We've got our null hypothesis, which is that the mean on both of these is the same, and our alternative, because we're interested in does it improve SAT scores, is going to be that the average <coughs> on the easy SAT is greater than the average for business as usual. So we, we collected data on 100 people in these histograms. We have a plot of them. See these two histograms? They look pretty similar. Now, the, the average for, for easy SAT was slightly higher, right? So maybe it's like here, whereas for the business as usual, it was like here. So it's slightly higher, but those two distributions overlap a lot. And I'm willing to imagine that if you were looking at this data, everybody would be like, these are two bell-shaped. Their centers are basically the exact same. So unsurprisingly, if you were to do a hypothesis test, either using a randomization uh, test or uh, a t-test, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks, the p-value is uh, 0.187. In other words, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that there's no evidence that easy SAT trademark improves SAT scores relative to what students would do on their own. So... This is a problem, right? Because like, you know, easy SAT, they want to make some money and they're not showing evidence of their program working. So what can they do? Well, they've got a couple of different options. One option would be, of course, to go back and evaluate their program and see, well, maybe there's something with the easy SAT trademark um, studying, pro, uh, studying model and maybe we need to trade it, uh, change it to make it a little bit better. Or what they decided to do was to do another study, right? What they've decided to do is to get a bigger study. So using a larger sample size. Let's do it with 5,000, okay? So we've got these 5,000 students. They're shown in this histogram right here. Easy SAT on the bottom. Business as usual on the top. What do you think? Do you see a difference? Does it look like there's a significant difference between these two groups? You're probably thinking, no, Chris, there doesn't look like there's a difference. However, you're wrong. 
there is a significant difference. Again, there was only a seven point increase. So 540 versus 547 this time. And the, but the p-value was very small, less than 0 0.001. And the company rejects the null hypothesis. They conclude there is strong evidence that easy SAT improves test scores relative to what students would typically do on their own. The effect size, and effect size is just sort of a, a fancy word for maybe like the, the difference or whatever it is that we're kind of measuring. This seven point increase of their product is still the same. But now, because they have a sample size of 5,000, look at this. They're able to conclude that their program works. So my question is for, to you is, would you buy Easy SAT? Would you buy their product? $2,000, it yields statistically significant results. So this brings up the notion of practical significance versus statistical significance. And I would argue that this is one of the hardest things for people to understand. So you can have statistical significance, but you, but you may not have practical significance. And practical significance relates to this notion of an effect size. Um, and, and by practical significance, I just mean if you're looking at these results and the difference is only seven points, does that mean anything? Sure, it's statistically significant, and you're, we're going to find out why um, that's the case momentarily. But does it mean anything? Is it practically significant? Would you now go and use this program? I'm guessing everybody would say no. I wouldn't. It's two thousand dollars. It takes a couple. Weeks. It takes six weeks of my time. I don't want to do it. Or maybe I even said ten weeks. I don't remember. And so this relates to this notion of practical significance. I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding if something is practically significant or not. Um, they they see, hear the results statistically significant, and they sort of ignore the notion of practical significance. But this is an important thing to keep in mind whenever you hear the word statistically significant is trying to think to yourself, well, do the results matter? Because statistical significance is going to be a function of your sample size. As your sample size increases, the, the likelihood of getting statistically significant results increases dramatically. <clears throat> we'll see that. Suppose some experts believe that the proportion of lakes in Vermont with unsafe mercury levels could be proportion equals to 0.2. But others believe that the proportion of lakes with unsafe mercury in Vermont is greater than 0.2. Specifically, they want to test the following hypotheses. That the proportion of lakes in Vermont with with mercury is point with uh, unsafe mercury is 0.2 versus the alternative that the proportion is greater than 0.2. So let's think about this. What if they surveyed 100 lakes, collected water on those 100 lakes, and 25 of them had un unsafe mercury levels? What is our p-value and what will we conclude? So let's just put our p-hat. 25 over 100, right? So one quarter, which is 0 0.25. So, and then for the one below here, it says, well, but what if they surveyed 500 lakes? So what if our sample size was 500 and 125 of them had unsafe mercury? What would we conclude then? Notice our p-hats are going to be the same, 0.25. Well, let's run this experiment in uh, StatKey. We know we can do a randomization test for this. It's just, a diff it's just a single proportion. And so we can do this just knowing our sample size and knowing the number of people that, um, knowing the number of people, excuse me, that lakes, not people, knowing, knowing the number of lakes where there was unsafe mercury. All right, so first thing we want to do, after we click stat key and randomization test for proportion, we want to put in our null hypothesis value, which is going to be 0 0.20. And then we need to edit our data. And in the first situation, we had 25 lakes that had mercury in it out of a total of 100. We see our information here. Let's generate 1,000 samples. Oops. And by 1,000, I mean 10,000. Right tail test. Change this value from 0.28 to 0.25. Hey, OK. Our p-value is 0 0.131. So 0 0.131. We conclude 
We failed to reject the null hypothesis if we were using an alpha equals 0 0.05. And we would conclude that there's, there's, there's not enough evidence to support the alternative. There's weak evidence to support it. So we would conclude that the proportion of lakes in Vermont uh, that have unrest, unsafe mercury, uh, is no different than 0.2. But now let's look at the other example. Let's, we need to now edit data again. This time we're going to put in 125 lakes out of 500. Again, we see we have that same proportion. Hopefully you can see that. My null hypothesis value stays the same, and I'll generate 10,000 lakes. Uh, not lakes, 10,000 samples. Click right tail, change this value to... 0.2. Oops, excuse me. Hopefully you caught that this should be 0.25, the sample mean. And now our p-value is 0 0.0031. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis now. And we conclude that, in fact, the proportion of lakes in Vermont with unsafe mercury levels is greater than uh, 0.2. Hmm, the only thing that changed really is not the proportions, right? The proportions are the same, just the sample size. So this is the impact of the sample size on significance. So a larger sample size makes it easier to find significant results if the null hypothesis is true. I mean, if the alternative hypothesis is true. Now, going back here, or I, I will explain it momentarily what that means, but... Um, so if, if this is true, if our null, if our alternative is true, that means that as we increase our sample size, that the, the ability for us to reject the null hypothesis, the probability for us to reject, reject the null hypothesis is going to increase when this is true. So this is what's known as power. And actually a type two error and remember, a type 2 error occurs when you don't reject the null hypothesis. A type 2 error is known as beta, while a type 1 error is known as alpha. And power is going to be equal to 1 minus beta. And power is that probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, given that the alternative is true. Now, a small sample size means you have very low power, and it's difficult to reject the null hypothesis, even when the alternative is true. That is unless your effect is very large. Now, a large sample size means you have a lot of power, and it's much easier to reject the null hypothesis. Even if your effect is trivial. So, what does that mean? So remember, all this is saying is that the alternative hypothesis is true. So if we were to think about Our example from before, okay, the proportion uh, is equal to 0.2 versus the proportion is equal to, I mean, is greater than 0.21. Now, for the alternative hypothesis to be true, all that means is that the proportion has to be greater than 0.20. Okay, well, that means that the proportion could be, um, I don't know, 0.201 or... 0 0.2001 or 0 0.20001 and so on and so on and so on. And remember, we use our sample proportion as our proxy for our population proportion. So the fact remains is that when our sample size gets larger, our alternative hypothesis is nearly always true because the fact is that for this value to exactly equal 0.2, is very improbable. And so as our sample size increases, our ability to detect minuscule and trivial differences goes up substantially. So this relates, this notion of the sample size and significance, relates to the notion of practical significance. So as you increase your sample size, your ability to de detect trivial um, effects becomes much larger. So you'll note that when I did, uh, when you gave me your pilot data, I did a power analysis. Uh, 
And essentially the power analysis, I determined what your effect size was. I determined your effect size based on your pilot data. And then what I did doing a power analysis, and we're not going to really talk about it, is I determined what your sample size needs to be. to reject the null hypothesis, given that the alternative is true. So, I did, and, and essentially, what you do, just like your alpha has this value of 0 0.05, we typically want power to equal 0 0.8. And so, using this information, I was able to do a power analysis to determine the sample size you needed for the islands. Now, you don't need to worry about those details, the most important piece to note is that as your sample size increases, your uh, the your ability to reject your null hypothesis becomes a lot greater, and your ability to conclude differences, even if they're trivial, becomes a lot larger.